and get on your feet as we bring to the stage with a thunderous, massive, eight percent applause, one of my best buddies in the industry, Mr. Roger Short. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here with you today. How cool is it to be in a room with a bunch of people who just want to win, and you're surrounded by them? It was your choice to put yourself in this room, and I'm honored to be here with you, not just to be on stage presenting to you, but to actually be with you in the room, rubbing elbows, locking arms, learning with you. So thank you for being here for me and my team so that we can learn from you. And a big shout out and thank you to Cody and Lauren Askins and the entire 8% team. I know there's been an unbelievable amount of effort and work went into this. I want to give a particular shout out to Cassidy and Kelly and Andy. Can you do that for me? Great job on those guys. Well, uh, I represent the Life Insurance Academy, as you can see. And today we're going to do a little bit of training. Can we do that? Can we dive in and do some training and talk about some, uh, some things that can maybe move the needle a little bit in your life? Um, Daniel Pink, a student of human behavior, author of a book called Persuasion, another great book called To Sell is Human, teamed up with a data analytics firm, and they surveyed 7,000 adult U.S. workers. 7,000. That's seven times the people that are in this room. How accurate do you think the numbers are at the end of that study, right? And they were trying to determine what the behavior patterns were with people interacting with each other throughout the day. And one of the most interesting questions that came out of that survey was this, that I found fascinating. What percentage of your work, what time amount that you put in of your work every day is persuading, influencing, or convincing someone else to give up something that they value, their time, their money, their resources, their position, their desired outcome, for a position that you're proposing or you're presenting. Interesting. The number was absolutely astonishing. 41% was the time that people said they're spending moving people toward their position. When we think about that, it's astonishing. 24 minutes out of every hour of every day, we are trying to convince someone to do something that we want. We're not only doing it in the workplace, we're doing it at home. How many people know that you like, hey, where are we going for lunch? Let's, let's do Mexican, right? Where are we going tomorrow for coffee? What about vacation? Whose parents are we going to see this holiday, right? Are they coming here? Are we going there? What about our budget? What about Christmas? Where are, we, where are we spending the 4th of July? We do these things every day in our lives. We are all persuaders. Another fascinating question that was asked of the same group was this. When you think of sales or salespeople, what is the first word that comes to your mind? Let's hear some of those words. Resistance, aggressive, pushy, consultative. What else? Come on, give me. Sleazy, where's my wallet? Right? Fascinating. So the question, what's the first word that comes to mind when you think of sales or salespeople? Check out the responses. The smaller the words, the less frequent, the larger the words, these were the most common. The largest word that was given among 7,000 people, the most common word was pushy. How do you feel about that? How do you guys feel about that? How many people in the room are in sales? <laughs> huh? Guess what? The world thinks we're pushy. The world thinks we're sleazy, difficult, hard, yuck, uncomfortable, fake, essential, challenging, necessary, cheesy, manipulative, scary, tough, slimy, and painful. I don't see myself that way, do you? I don't see myself that way. Interesting how people separated in their mind what they do 41% of their day from an actual concept called sales. And yet at its base level, sales and selling is what? It is persuasion, it is influence persuasion and influence. It's moving people to your desired position. So if you have 
a career choice in sales, how much more important is it for us to understand the concepts behind what moves people to a better, what moves people to your desired position and how to implement it into your process? Because who wants to be one of these people? We don't like these people and we certainly shouldn't want to be one of these people. Would you agree? Aristotle said this, persuasion is the art of getting someone to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do if you didn't ask them. If you didn't ask them. You see, I believe persuasion is a beautiful thing. I believe it's a beautiful thing. I believe that your influence and persuasion should be used to move people to a better place. It should be used for good. We're in an honorable profession. What we do changes people's lives. We make a difference in people's lives every day with our products and our services. You make a, different in, you make a difference in your life with your belief and the ability to change someone and move them to a better place. I believe sales should be ethical. I believe it should be strong, powerful, and convincing. And I believe you should know how to craft a message that is ethical, strong, powerful, and convincing, and understand the fundamentals of what it needs to be created in a fashion that you can deliver that every time. Every time. You see, when we think of ethical selling, here's my definition. Ethical selling is the art of creating a willing and desired exchange of value that moves people to a better place. We should all desire for people to uh, move to a better place. We should all use our skill set to enrich their lives. If you're in the business of serving you, you're in the wrong business. I challenge you to leave the room. If you're here because you want to help other people and by doing so you can help yourself, you're in the right room. So welcome. So let's learn together. I have some questions for you. How many of you ever lost a sale? <laughs> How many of you have ever gotten objections and then you're doing rebuttals and then another objection and then another rebuttal and you get in this endless cycle? Anybody have ever felt that before? Be honest. Be honest. Even you, Cody, right? We've all been there. How many of you feel like you finally figured out sales, you're on a roll, and then for no reason the wheels fall off and you get into a slump? How many people have ever hit a sales slump? Right? Slumps. Right? That, that word is just ugly. Slump. Right? Who wants to slump? How many of you have ever just tried to maybe duplicate somebody? Like, there's a top producer. I'll just do what they do. Because certainly if I just do that, that will work for me. But guess what? You're not them. Your personality is different. You are uniquely wired to be you. And you're just doing, a, a, you're just doing actions. You don't understand the philosophy or the concepts behind it or the psychology behind what's going on. What if you could implement a process into your delivery that you could go back to and you could craft craft a presentation that delivered a one-call close over 87% of the time. Would you guys be interested in that? I only heard a few woos. Can you believe that? 87% close rate. I'm going to deliver to you some concepts today that's going to give you that. If you're leading a team and you're trying to teach people, and you're trying to lead them, and they've all got different personalities, some of us spend more hours just on the phone trying to hold people in before they quit so they can make enough money to stay in long enough to keep them going. How many of you relate to what I'm saying? Yeah. Right? You've been there. If you understand the concepts and the psychology behind the five fundamentals of a one-call close, you can craft that into a presentation, into a training platform, and teach your people to build their own presentation, build on some fundamentals that work, that are true. So at the Life Insurance Academy, we're going to help you. We're going to help you learn how to apply the principles of psychology and selling. We're going to teach you a process designed exclusively for you, not for me. You're not Roger Short. You're not Coach Michael Burt. You're not Cody Askins. You're not Pete Fournier. It's hard to duplicate specifically someone else. But if you know the principles, you can design your six-figure presentation. And then lastly, eliminate objections and close more sales. Aristotle, in his writing, Rhetoric, proposed that there were three terms that he associated with rhetoric and persuasion. He believed that an argument or an appeal should uh, relate to three areas. Number one, ethos. Ethos, or an appeal to ethics, character, and trust. Ethics, ethos. Secondly, he believed that it should appeal to pathos, an appeal to the emotions or the feelings. This is where we get into the internal need of somebody, their state of mind. How do they feel about their problem? And how do they feel if we can help them solve their problem? Do they feel like it's a win? And then lastly, logos, an appeal to the logic and facts. And if we're addressing these three areas in our presentations, in our arguments, 
in our sales, in our consultation, in our phone sales, in our face-to-face sits at a kitchen table, then we've got a winning platform. We've got a winning program. You see, we are all different. We are all different. And it's important to understand the principles of how to build your own one-call close presentation. How many of you would like to know some of those principles today? We're going to walk you through those. You see, what you do matters. We're in a life change business. We're in a life change business. Anybody can buy insurance from anyone. Did you know that? Right? Did you know that what we, what we offer is a commodity? You can literally dial 1-800-MEDICARE or 1-800-LIFE and get a policy. You know this, right? So what separates you from 1-800-DIAL-A-POLICY? 1-800-DIAL-A-POLICY in you, the difference is, is that you are a person with a specific skill set who knows how to transfer your knowledge and your belief to the other person so they take an action, so they get moved to a better place. You enrich their lives. You see, I believe we're all called to be difference makers. I've been wearing this wristband now for about seven years. You can stop by our booth. You can get one. Put one on. Look at it every day and say, I'm called to be a difference maker in my industry. You see, I believe we should raise the standard of selling to this place of ethical selling where people are moved to a better place. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Your message is important. You need to learn how to tell it. It will change people's lives. So, five fundamentals of a one-call close. This, this will not be steps. These are not steps. This is concepts. This is psychology of selling. Are you ready for the first one? Who's with me? Are you ready? Yeah. All right. I don't want to be pushy, but I want to be convincing. I want to be persuasive. The first one is, number one, we need to transfer belief. We need to transfer belief. You see, when you're sitting with somebody, the thing that they, they feel from you is whether you believe what you're saying. Do you guys believe what Cody, do you guys feel what Cody speaks when he says it? Do you believe that he believes? Yes. There's some people when they're communicating to you, you know you're speaking with somebody. You know you're talking to somebody who believes what they say. When you're able to transfer belief to another individual, it makes all the difference in the world. So you need to know what is my belief statement. What is my belief statement? Do you have one? Do you have a belief statement crafted for your presentation? You see, I believe that insurance is not a nice to have, it's a must have. I've seen the devastation and loss of too much financial tragedy and sadness and family strife and, and things go crazy when people are not properly prepared for that day when it's gonna come for all of us. Either through a, a tragic accident or obviously the, the ultimate tragedy of death. Are those families prepared? I've seen too much hurt on the other side of that. And so I've made it my life's mission to help people set that aside and create peace of mind so their family never has to worry about the financial situation again and that when you leave, you leave them in a better place. How many people want to leave the people we love in a better place? Can I get a yes? Yes. yes. We want to leave people in a better place. What does a belief statement look like? It needs to have unquestionable conviction unquestionable conviction. They need to know that you believe that what you have to serve them with is going to improve their lives. It's going to be good for them. It's going to be there on the day when they get that diagnosis of cancer. I just, we lost my sister-in-law just last year after a three-year battle of cancer. She did not know that was coming. Her and her husband just finished their brand new retirement home on the river in eastern Canada on a river that I grew up on, absolutely big, beautiful, blue salmon river. I mean, it's just spectacular. They were getting ready to move in there. She got the diagnosis of cancer. They were not ready for that. They were not ready for it. Guys, our products and services helps people like my sister-in-law put things in place for their family. They were able to use the finances and funds from some of the things they had to take that one last vacation to Disney World and bring everybody down. Like, these are life-changing moments. Do you believe that what you do makes a difference? Do you have unquestionable conviction? Secondly, you need to have undeniable confidence. Confidence that you are the most uniquely qualified person at that moment, on that phone, on that Zoom call, in that kitchen, face-to-face -face with them. You are the most qualified person to help them solve their problem. 
It doesn't matter whether you just started last week. I guarantee you, if you're a licensed life insurance agent, you've gone through contracting, if you are a Medicare advisor and you've done your, your process and you've, you've completed your AHIP and all the certifications of everything that needs to be done, when you're talking to that person, you are the most qualified person in the room and you have a group of people around you that you can network with to help them if you don't have the direct answer. So be confident that you are the most uniquely qualified person. Um, Seven years ago in Monk's Corner, South Carolina. Anybody know where Monk's Corner, South Carolina is in the room? Yeah. You guys know where that is? Down near Charleston. We did a training workshop there about seven years ago, and uh, I met a guy by the name of Frank. Frank was a pharmacist that moved, relocated from New York to South Carolina because the weather was better in the winter. And we did a training session, and I jumped in the car with Frank the next day. We went out and started serving families, and we wrote some policies, and we blessed some people. And we walked into this home at the end of this little dirt road, like seven houses on the dirt road, just around the bend. And at the very end of the street, facing the street, was this little house with a big front porch. And we pulled up there and we walked in and we were sitting at the table and I got to meet Sister Wynn. W-I-N-N, Wynn. I think her name was Winifred. Winifred, anybody know a Winifred? Probably a grandmother, right? This lady was tall, she was statuesque. She stood with a good posture. She had long hair down to here black and gray at the age of about 75 years old. She was wearing a muumuu from here to here. I didn't know what a muumuu was until that day. I found out, right? Some of you say, what is a muumuu? You can Google it. Look it up. Um, and she came to the door and introduced us and sat us down. Her husband had just suffered a stroke about a year or so before and had not fully recovered. He was in a wheelchair. He could not speak and he could not walk. He was able to move himself around, but that was it. We were sitting at the table having a conversation. I was diving in, Frank was observing, we were doing shadowing, and I was doing discovery with her to try to find out what her need was. Do they have coverage? What do they need? Do they have other policies in place? We're having a conversation, and she's talking to me about her life. I find out that she's a radio preacher, and she's telling me she's excited about this. And in the middle of her telling me that story, all the air stopped going in and out of her lungs. In the middle of her sentence, she just stopped. I thought, did she forget what she was about to say? So I was waiting. It's like one of those pauses for dramatic effect. Nope. I looked at Frank. Frank looked at me, and she was like this. And she started to do this universal sign for I can't breathe or I'm choking. You know, this sign. I'm looking at Frank. I'm going, I don't know what's happening right now. We haven't been eating anything. There's just a glass of water on the table. Nothing's happening. Within about 30 seconds, we were in a desperate situation because she still couldn't breathe. She was pounding her chest. She was asking me to hit her back. So I'm standing up and I'm hitting a 75-year-old lady on the back, in the middle of her back. I'm going, dear God, don't let me break anything right now. Please let her breathe. Please let her breathe. She's not breathing. I come around and I look at the front of her and she's, she's like this and she's like confused why she can't breathe. 35, 40 seconds in. Do you know how long 35, 40 seconds is when you stop breathing and you didn't know you were going to stop breathing? It's, it's terrifying. I saw the fear in her eyes. I'm looking at Frank. Frank is seated. His hands are locked on the table. Her husband is in the wheelchair. His eyes are glued on me. I'm standing there going, I'm the most qualified person in the room. And I believe that when I walked into this house today, I was there to help her. Regardless of whether they place a policy with me or not, I'm there to serve. I'm there to be a difference maker. So Roger, step up. Believe it, take action, have undeniable confidence. I don't know how to do the Heimlich, I don't know how to do CPR, but I gotta do something because she's in a desperate situation. And just a couple seconds later, she runs right out the front door. Right out the front door. Frank and I are at the table going, what just happened? She went out the front door. I guess she figured if she got some fresh air, that would change things. And now she's got her hands up to God and she's praying to Jesus that she will breathe. I can literally see her mouthing the words. And I run out the front door. Her husband comes out behind me. They're looking out the door. Frank's looking over the husband. And I'm standing looking at Sister Wynn. And I go, Sister Wynn, dear God, I'm going to have to give you mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation right here on your front porch at the end of this lane standing up. You haven't even passed out, and I'm going to have to do this. I don't know what else to do. And I was like, I'm going to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. I'm looking at her husband for permission, right? <laughs> I'm like, dear God, I'm about to put my lips on a 75-year-old stranger's mouth on her front porch in front of her husband and Frank the pharmacist. <laughs> and everybody's eyes is like this, including mine. And Sister Wynn is like this. And I go in and I said, dear God, let this work. Please let it work. Hands on nose, finger on nose, mouth under the chin, and literally I lock lips with a 75-year-old lady with a little mustache right here. I didn't know she had it until I felt it. <laughs> and I blew as hard as I possibly could. 
nothing. Felt like I was trying to blow up one of those hot water bottles you put in your bed at night. Nothing was happening. I stepped back. Her eyes were bigger than ever. I went to the back again. I'm doing the Heimlich. I'm going, dear God, I don't know what to do. I just pray that the cops don't come around this corner while she's passing out and dying because I'm going to jail. I don't know what to do. I step around again. I said, Sister Wynn, I'm coming in again. She goes, okay. And I came in again for a second kiss. And I'm in and I got, I'm, I'm going this time. I am convinced that I'm getting through. I've got undeniable confidence that my breath is stronger than her blockage. And at that moment, I blew as hard as I possibly could. And at that moment, I felt the air going into her lungs. And at that moment, she went, <laughs> and I stepped back. I go, get her some water. And she's like, no. About a minute and 10 seconds had gone by, guys. Like, that is the longest time in eternity. A minute and 10 seconds with a 75-year-old woman is not breathing at your appointment. A couple, uh, about 20 or 30 minutes later, we're sitting having a conversation with her daughter who came just from down the street. Sister Wynn's over in the corner. I said to Frank, Frank, we're probably not going to wrap up this sale today. We're going to leave. But I want you to come back and talk to the daughter and see them next week. I won't be here, but you can do it. And I said, after you saw what I did, you can do anything, right? He goes, I think so. <laughs> we talked to the daughter. The next week, Frank went back and took care of the family and put some policies in place. Two months later, I forgot about the story. Two months later, I'm sitting at home in my kitchen in the island in the morning having coffee with my wife on a Saturday morning. The phone rings from Monk's Corner, South Carolina. I pick up the phone. Hello, Mr. Roger. This is Sister Wynn. I prayed that I would always get to see an angel one day. I, little did I know that on that day two months ago, God sent me two and without you being there that day to serve us with your insurance, I probably wouldn't be having this conversation with you today. So thank you for doing that, and thank you for what you do. That's all I have. I just want to say thank you. You're a blessing. And she hung up the phone. And I thought, you know what? That's so much like our life insurance business. We're always so close to giving up on ourselves because we don't have this undeniable confidence. We don't have a, 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 an unquestionable conviction. And sometimes we forget that we're just there to serve. So every day when you get up to walk into someone's home or you get on the phone, say to yourself, just wire yourself, put it on a card, write it on your window, whatever you gotta do. Say, I am gonna be a difference maker in this person's life today. Whether they do an insurance policy with me or not, I'm gonna help change their lives. I'm gonna be a blessing and it will come back to me. Take that mission, be a difference maker. Learn to tell your message. Learn to tell your message. Your message is important. Learn how to tell it. It will change people's lives. Secondly, we're going to establish trust. we got to establish trust. There's two ways that you're going to do that. Firstly, you need to demonstrate empathy. In order to establish trust with anyone, you need to understand them. Understanding someone is the difference in selling something to someone to serve your interest or finding out about what they really need so that you can meet their internal need and serve their interest. And it's called empathy. How do we get to empathy? We get to empathy by asking good questions. Asking good questions. I got a question for somebody. I hope this mic is on. So if we can get the lights up, that'd be great. Who is in the life insurance or Medicare space here? Hands up, real high, real high, real high. All right, great. Who here came this weekend hoping to make a major change in their life to take a different trajectory that you're hoping this year was the year? This year was the year. All right. You got my attention over here when you raise your hand. What's your name? Kim Inninger. Kim? Kim, it's so nice to meet you. My name is Roger. It's a pleasure. Kim, what, what's your biggest takeaway you're hoping to get from this event this weekend? I just want to learn um, more about Medicare and the networking is what I'm here for, just to see what other people are doing and how I can implement that in my business. And why, why are you trying to do that? I want things better for my family, take care of my kids and my parents and just better my community. Beautiful. How many children do you have? I have five children. Five children. That's commendable. How old's your oldest? My oldest is 16, and my youngest is six. Six. And when you say, I want to make things better for them, what kind of things do you see for their future that you want to accomplish? Well, I don't want them to have struggles like I've had. So I just want them to have opportunities to better themselves in life and not have to... Um, 
you know, worry about taking care of their, their families when they're bigger. Kim, you also mentioned your parents. I didn't forget about that. Tell me about your parents. Well, they're getting older, you know, they're actually about to be on Medicare soon. And mm -hmm. so I just like, I can relate to that mm -hmm. because it is confusing. We've talked about that mm -hmm. but for people who don't know what it's about. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like I can empathize with them yeah. and help other people to know what they're doing and not, not feel that confusion and scariness of having to start mm -hmm. on why is it important to you to set up this life for your children the way you, the way you just described it to me? Why is that important to you? Well, just because I didn't have that. So um, I think that with my children, I just want them to know that like anything's possible. They're not mm -hmm. limited to what they can do. So mm -hmm. I feel like... If they see me succeed and accomplish something big and great, then they're going to know that they can do that also. Kim, if I can come alongside you and help you in some small way in our business, and we can come alongside you, there's no strings attached, would you allow me the opportunity to do that with you to help you accomplish that for your kids? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. All right. Give it up for Kim. So, ladies and gentlemen... What we just did there was I did discovery with Kim so that I could understand why she wants to learn about Medicare. Because she doesn't want to learn about Medicare. If all that was taken care of for her and her family's needs were all entirely taken care of, would that be a big passion for her? You see, her passion is her children creating an opportunity for them, limitless dreaming, anything's possible, and making sure her, fa her parents' health is handled in their aging years. And she is creating a pattern of legacy for her children. And she's demonstrating to her children also about how to take care of your parents. Is that honorable? Yes. Give her a hand for that. Now that I know that that's honorable, I can do that and I can help her solve that need. I can help meet her need. And now I have a reason or a justification for providing a product or service that's going to help meet her need. See, I did discovery with her as I would with a client in a home or on the phone. So the question is, why did you attend? Why is that important to you? You see, there's this idea of attunement in sales. I don't know if you've ever, guys, you've ever seen one of these, but it's called a tuning fork. You guys ever seen this? Tuning fork. When you hit this thing hard enough on something, you may not be able to hear it. It creates a sound wave. And that sound wave, when it's out of harmony with the thing that it's trying to tune, creates a, an inconsistent sound wave. What you're trying to do is bring those sound waves together so that you can have another person's perspective. That's what a tuning fork does. So I want you to remember this. How do I attune myself to someone else? You do that with empathy, with asking good questions. Asking good questions. Next, we're going to establish authority. Authority. You have to be an authority figure. You have to be an educator. You have to know your craft. You will have to study, Kim, to become a master at your craft. And we can help you with that. We can help you learn that. Establishing authority, you will do that through your association, the organization you're with, and also uh, through becoming an educator, a teacher. Someone who educates their clients is someone who makes them feel valued. You're taking time to educate them so they can make the best choice. Thirdly, we're going to address the stakes. The stakes, not Ruth Chris stakes, not Morton stakes, but the stakes. What's there to gain and what is there to lose? What is there to gain and what is there to lose? When we address the stakes, most people want to focus on benefits. This is what this plan has. It can slice, it can dice, it can do this. And wait, there's more. We want to do that. People take action more on what they might lose than what they can gain. It's called the fear of loss cognitive bias. It's a framing concept we talk about at the academy. And if you understand cognitive biases, the, the stakes or a fear of loss stake is a powerful one. So make sure you address it. You see, one of the things that I would like to know from Kim, and I will ask her, she doesn't have to answer, is Kim, what happens if you go out of here this weekend and you don't achieve the goal that you set out to do and you don't become financially successful in this business and you can't take care of your parents the way you want to, what, what does that mean for you? And I'm going to have that conversation. 
I'm going to have that conversation with my client in the home. If we don't take care of this, what's it going to look like being in the funeral home and knowing that your family is there trying to figure out how they're going to pay for not, not all the loss of income, how they're just going to even pay for a basic funeral benefit? And what about the house? How do the kids go to college? What about t-ball? What about field hockey practice? What about summer camp? Who pays for that? How does that make you feel? Why is that important to you? When you address the stakes with people, it helps them understand uh, what there is to lose. It's called the fear of loss cognitive bias. My daughter and I, Olivia, she's the only daughter of mine that's not here today. I have two other daughters, one sitting right here in the front row in C2. You can wave, Ashlyn. Wave your hand. There she is. You guys can say hi to her later. She's phenomenal. My other daughter is just back here. She's actually, will be at our booth, Madison. So Ashlyn and Madison are here. This is Olivia. Olivia is my adventure buddy. We like to climb mountains together. One of my dreams is to climb Kilimanjaro. It's on the calendar, slated for next year, provided COVID guidelines allows us to travel. But this is in the Colorado Rockies, and this is on Father's Day weekend. We went out there and spent three days together, and we decided to climb the Decalibron. The Decalibron is a four-summit loop where you actually hit four 14,000-foot peaks in one day. Start about 5.30, finish at about 3 or 4.30 in the afternoon, and you can actually hit four of them. One of those is closed because it's actually on private land, and they've actually closed it, so we knew we were going to try to do three of them that day. Now, this looks like a happy summit picture, and I posted this one on social media. Some of you who follow me, by the way, you can follow me on Instagram, Roger Short. You can follow me on Facebook, Roger Short. I would love to have you as my friend on social and in person. Um, but you probably saw this. Here's the next photo. The next photo is at the peak of the second summit, Mount Cameron. And this photo looks a little different from the first one. This photo, we are actually prostate on the ground because the winds were so high that we actually only were uh, at this, we were only at this summit for about 90 seconds. You see, what happened between the first summit, coming back down to the saddle, and then climbing the second summit was the scary part, and there are no pictures. There's no pictures because the winds were gusting about 25 to 30 miles an hour when we started to make our way up the second summit. By the time we were halfway up, the winds had picked up speeds to about sustained winds of about 40 miles an hour and gusts of 75 to 80 miles an hour as we're climbing up a summit on a four-foot path with a 1,000 foot of scree straight down. And if we fall over there, it's not going to be pretty. There's just going to be a little patch of something at the end. And the wind is literally knocking us over. And if you guys ever go to a gym and you know what a bear crawl is, we were literally bear crawling up a mountain. It was not fun. We got to a point where the winds were gusting over 90 miles an hour. It was, it was terrifying. My hands were freezing. I had to find a little crevasse to put some gloves on and get a, another layer on under that. I couldn't hear because the wind was so loud in our helmets, in our, in our hoods, we couldn't even hear each other talk. We were literally screaming at each other. I'm going, Olivia, we need the photo. Let's sit down here and take it. She goes, no, no. I go, sit down, smile now, click. That was it. She stopped smiling. We got up and we started, we had to make a decision. So Olivia said to me at that point of no return before we made the second summit, she said, Dad, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm nervous. Uh, I'm, I've never been in this situation and you're the dad and I need you to make a decision. And for the first time, my brave daughter who was in front of me for all of our other climbs, I could feel her move behind me. She's like, protect me. And I had to make a decision. Do we go back down the mountain with a four-foot path with gusts of winds 80 and 90 miles an hour with all that treachery? Or do we actually climb higher to make the summit and try to pick up the trail on the other side and come down the other side of the mountain? So here was the stakes. I said, Olivia, we're on a mountain. <laughs> this is very dangerous. We could die. We need to make a decision. We need to get off this mountain. She said, the decision's yours. She was trusting me in my confidence and my conviction. I said, we're going to go up. We're going to make this summit, and we're going to go down the other side of that thing. And so we did, and we went down over the other side in the wind, and we were in the lull for about an hour. And it was so great. And then when we came out around the corner for the next four hours, we were in those 90-mile-an-hour winds again, trying to get down off of this mountain. This is the picture of us as we got back down almost to the green space. And I think this tells the story. Guys, sometimes you have to be honest with each other, and you have to show unquestionable conviction and undeniable confidence. You have to be really real about what's at stake and you need to make a decision and move your clients to a better place. It's no different in life. It's no different when you're in the living room. It's no different when you're on the phone. Move them to a better place, but be honest with them about what's going to happen if you make a bad decision and you don't take action. Next, we're going to present the options. Um, and presenting the options is really about giving people choice. 
It's about giving people choice. And when you give people choice, they feel empowered. You've educated them. Now you're giving them a choice. People don't like to be sold, right? We've all heard this. People don't want to be sold, but they do like to buy, but they do like a guide to tell them which would be the best decision if you've earned their respect and their trust and they believe you. And when you give them that choice, it makes a difference in how they move forward because you're empowering them to make a decision for themselves. So I challenge you, if you're in the home, don't sit across the table from people. Get beside them and become an advisor like their son, like their daughter, like a brother who's helping them get something they want and helping them achieve it. Become someone who presents the options. There was a study done in California with jam. Jam. Some of us give too many options. Some of us say, well, you can do this and you can do that. And this kind of benefit does this and this one does that. And we got this one. And this prescription drug program covers all this. But if you do this Medicare plan, it includes that. And we totally overwhelm people. There was a study done with Jam in, 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 in California. And they took, these researchers went to either side of a large grocery store. And they set up one table. And at that table, they had 32 jams, all with open lids for taste testing on these little gourmet breads. And at the other end of the store, way, this is a large store. At the other end of the store, they had the same, same company with a small table with three jams open, and all the rest of them were on display behind them, but with only three available for tasting. The one that had 32% at the end of the day, they totaled up how many people took action. 3.1% of the people bought jam at the 32% op at the 32 option table. At the three option table, 32% took action. Limit your options. Make them viable, make them honest, make them true, limit your options, and give them a clear choice so that they can make a simple decision with your guidance, with a recommendation. Keep it simple. If you confuse, you lose. Lastly, we're going to provide the solution. We're going to provide a solution. Seems rudimentary when we walk through it, but every part of this process so far, these psychology principles, the five fundamentals of a no-closed presentation, are designed on Aristotle's three areas, pathos, logos, ethos. And if we build these into our presentation, you can, you can then take your message and move it so that you're taking people and helping them get to a better place. You see, your message is important. You need to learn how to tell it. It will change people's lives. When you provide the solution, you're giving people an easy off-ramp to make a decision. You don't want it confusing. You don't want to have them to do a U-turn and come back around and try to get back the next day and confuse them. And three proposals later, make it simple. Help them choose. Cody stood on this stage and said, who else wants to join us? And here are three options that you can participate in today. I said, Cody, that was one of the best three, call, three option closes I've ever seen. Would you agree? That was a really good close today. Provide the solution. You are a solution provider. You are a difference maker. Your message is important. Learn how to tell it. It will change people's lives. So it's going to change especially yours. I want you to say this with me. My message is important. My message is important. I will learn how to tell it. To tell it. And I will change people's lives. Do you believe that? Can we say it again, everyone? My message is important. My message is important. I will learn how to tell it. It will change people's lives. You see, we're going to walk through the five fundamentals of a one-call close. Transfer belief, establish trust, address the stakes, present the options, and provide the solutions. And as a thank you for your help today, Kim, we would like to come alongside you, and we would like to bless you with a one-year membership in a complete Life Insurance Academy course library. That course library includes a complete final expense selling system if you wanted to add final expense to your Medicare sales, a no-close final expense presentation mastery course, a, course, a reading the client course, a pricing strategy course. How do you give pricing to people so that you don't confuse them? Is there an affordability strategy? Is there a, um, a benefit strategy? Which strategy do I choose? And a brand new course which we just released called The Principles of Influence in Selling. One of my favorites. Coaches in Cars, Overcoming Ob Obstacles and Objections, Guide and Video Coaching, and two upcoming courses that we're releasing this fall, one on Mortgage Protection, Telesales Mastery, and another one on How to Sell Anything to Anyone, the Four Personalities course. We would like to give that to you, a one-year membership. Oh, I, I'm clicking this thing off again, people. I'm sorry. Oh, there we go. I'm, I'm, yes, let me go back. Can we go back one more? There we go. And, Kim, 
You also get one month access to our annual sales accelerator coaching program. So not only do we give you the courses, but you're going to get to interact with us for four weeks where we're going to deep dive and help you craft that message so that you can do that for your kids and you can also help your parents and create that legacy that you're looking to accomplish. Would that be good for you? And one more thing. One more thing. The team and I, we debated about this. We've never done this before. And uh, it's kind of like, what do we do? do, do is, there, is there an offer? What are, what are we offering? I said, guys, I just want to touch people's lives. I want to make a difference in their life. I want to be a difference maker in the industry. I want to help people level up their game. And we thought, I think it's crazy. So for the first time in Life Insurance Academy history, we're going to try to do something that's absolutely bonkers. And we're going to give you something that we've spent thousands of dollars developing, thousands of dollars in investing in, hours and hours of time, video production edit, and everyone gets a free course from the Academy. You get a course, you get a course, you get a course, you get a course. This course is the art of persuasion and the principles of influence and selling. This is a course designed for Medicare agents, PNC agents, life insurance agents, mortgage protection or final expense. You can learn how to master ethical selling and move people to a better place. This is how you get the course. Text your email address. We have to be able to email this to you. Text your email address to this number, 845-420-3337. The Principles of Influence and in Selling course is a must-have. It's going to help you understand how to implement the eight biggest principles in persuasion to become a master closer. One year access to the Principles of Influence Selling course, nine video lessons, notes, and quizzes. But more importantly, a course guidebook and a workbook for your personal training, but also for team training facilitation. How many of you would like to have content that you can take and use tomorrow to go out and teach someone something that you learned here today that will help improve their lives? How many people would like to do that? That's what we want to do for you at the Academy. Text your email address to this number right here. It's yours for free, but you have to take advantage of it today. This is an 8% onstage offer only. Text your email address too. So tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., we're going to take the next steps with you. We have a workbook for the first 100 people that attend for designing your six-figure presentation on a one-call close. Remember how I told you that you were unique, you're a unique personality? We have to take those steps down, implement it into your sales process for you. So Friday morning, 8 a.m. in the Embassy West Room, your host of the Life Insurance Academy podcast will be in there. My partner's Chris Ball, Zach McElwain, your host for the podcast, Austin Lopes-Silvero will be there. It's going to be a phenomenal time, 8 a.m. Don't get drunk tonight, 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. It's the first one. Attend, what's that? Saturday. Saturday, Saturday. What's today? Friday. Friday, tomorrow, yes, Saturday morning. Thank you, see? If you're honest and genuine with people, they will help you win. Thank you for helping me win. Attendees can win one of three LIA Complete Course libraries and annual memberships, and we're giving away two exclusive tickets to our Fall Game Changer Boot Camp. You can come find out all about that at the booth later. I want to leave this with you. I sat with a lady, her name was Jerry Hunter. I was helping her write a policy. It took me two months to find her. I wrote a policy for her as I was doing it. Her daughter, 49-year-old daughter, came in the room, at, came, showed up at the home. Her name was Sandra. Sandra sat there and wanted, wanted to know if she her, asked her mom, do you want me to get this guy out of here? She goes, no, she, she, he's helping me for you. A little later, I sat with Sandra and I said, Sandra, you need to put coverage in place for your mom. It's going to matter because... I know she's doing this for you, but what if something happens to you? Do you have any coverage? She goes, no, I don't. And so over the course of the next little while, we were able to talk to her about that. We set up a policy for her. She called me a year later, added some additional coverage. That additional coverage she added was for the mortgage on her home. And here's what happened. The following Christmas, I get a, a message on my phone. I pick up, listen to the message, and it's from a funeral home in the south end of Louisville, Kentucky, asking me for, to come and help with a death benefit claim on the life of Sandra. Not, not Jerry, but Sandra. I went out and met Jerry at the funeral home a couple days later to help her with the policy. And Jerry said to me, Roger, I don't know if this is going to pay. I'm scared to death. We don't have the finances. She was sitting there with a friend from church. In that same year, she lost her 91-year-old mother and her only daughter, and Jerry was now alone. And I said, Jerry, not only did Sandra love you and put this policy in place, it's going to pay out. She added an additional 40000 in coverage so you could pay off the mortgage on her home so you could move in here if anything ever happened and you wouldn't have a house payment anymore. And with that, she put her head on my shoulder 
and she wept, and there was tears down my shirt, and I left it there for three or four days to be reminded that what we do matters. It matters. It matters, people. You're called to be a difference maker. Let's be a difference maker. Let's move people to a better place. You see, your message is important. You need to learn how to tell it. It will change people's lives. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Give it up for Roger Short!